very much everyone for your time. This afternoon I'm going to run through fairly quickly Video Conference Room Design 101. Uh, as a lot of you would be aware there are entire careers in audio and lighting available so it's a very complex area. Um, by the end of today's session I intend to go over a few basics. Um, at the very least you'll be able to look at this picture on the first slide that we're viewing here and tell me exactly what what's wrong with that room design, where the flaws are and why you wouldn't do it that way. Anyway, let's kick into the material and have a look at the agenda. Room design, basic layout, um, lighting, audio, typical room layout and some considerations and things to talk about there and then finally room management. So let's hop into it. So room design, there's some really common sense things that we need to think about when we start setting up an audio visual room or a video conferencing room and quiet location is one of them. Um, external, external office noise and loud voices and coffee next to tea rooms and these sort of things are, are really, really unfortunate choices for a video conferencing room. Um, external noises have a way of coming through to the far end participants in a conference in a most distracting way. So let's avoid all of that and put some common sense into where we're going to locate it. Colours and finish. What we're looking for there is light colours, consistent colours, so uh, matte, light uh, creams, light blues, light greens, light grey sort of colours, matte paint finish, not a gloss and um, not striped wallpaper under any conditions. So as I said, um, flat matte designs. Having logos visible on the far wall or in the um, range of the camera in a video conference, usually just a uh, single colour logo looks very, very effective. Um, pictures and sceneries and photos of your favourite holiday resort are just a distraction and should be avoided at all costs. Um, the, the cupboards and things to hold the equipment, you know, fixed cabinets and or portable either way, make it pretty, make it attractive, make it so the people participating locally are going to enjoy it and it's aesthetically pleasing. Avoid shiny materials such as chrome. Um, in the table and chairs this is important as well. Um, avoid those chrome and highly reflective materials because they will reflect uh, light and any bright uh, light reflected back at the camera will make it hard for that camera sensor to operate collect correctly and get the correct ambient light um, settings. When, we come, when it comes to the table, we're looking for a light colour table because we're going to use that with our, in conjunction with our lighting to get the appropriate effect on all the people's faces. So we want a light colour table but not um, again, not shiny and highly reflective. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, no reflective material in the room at all if we can avoid it. Um, in terms in terms of the roof, two to two to three centimeter thick acoustic tiles or ten to f ten to fifteen centimeter insulation bats can be very effective in um, stopping external sound getting in and stopping reflection of sound off that roof space so I said uh, something to think about if you've got the resources and you've got a suspended ceiling this is the sort of thing you want to be looking at installing and in really extreme environments um, noise dampening wall panels are available they tend to be they tend to be if you imagine a sheet of timber with slots vertical slots cut into it where the slots are around about 20% of the width of the gap between the slots um, are a very effective um, echo cancelling um, noise dampening material. So as I said, if you're having trouble with echo and bounce and reverb in a room, some, some sort of noise dampening wall panels can be a very effective way and cost effective way of resolving that. Further on the room designs, if we've got windows then we want curtains and the curtains we're looking at full length and again a neutral colour. And the reasons that we're using these really light coloured paints and neutral colours in the curtains in, in a well lit room 
dark colours will throw a colour cast over everything. So a red wall will make everybody look like they've had a very big night out on the town. So as I said, neutral and pale colours in um, room furnishings. Um, glass is bad, um, acoustically and visually with reflections of light and reflections of sound. So no glass is better, but if you're going to have it, have full length curtains over them. Um, no lights directed at the camera for exactly the same reason that we don't want reflective materials, right? Um, it's anything that's going to bounce an uh, intense light source back at the camera sensor is going to make it hard for that camera to operate effectively. Um, additional furniture, avoid it if you can, but you know, in today's, in today's real world office, a lot of these um, video conferencing rooms are going to be multi-purpose, and so we got, are going to have additional furniture in there. So or stick to all the rules that we've discussed before, before not reflective, um, um, so not glass, etc, etc. Uh, microphones, single one if applicable, um, we'll talk a bit more about microphones later. Um, today, is in, with the cost of large screens today, we're looking at a minimum of a 50 inch screen, um, that can be very effective, but screen size is a factor of room size, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And very importantly, particularly if you're the sort of organisation that partakes in long conferences, allow for the extra cooling. Um, conference room with large panels, with other associated equipment and a number of people in there sitting, talking, participating in a conference uh, will get very uncomfortable very quickly if you don't allow for some extra cooling capacity. So lighting. Lighting is one of the areas that is easiest to break and has some of the simplest rules to get it right. So we can get a lot of bang for buck from having a look at the lighting and the environment we're going into. So direct lighting is bad, very harsh casts, big dark shadows, um, particularly on faces from eyebrows and the eyebrows and your nose, etc, etc. So um, indirect or diffused LED or fluorescent lights are very effective um, and indirect can mean bouncing them off the roof. Um, don't mix lighting types. Light, different lighting types have different temperatures as they say and what it really means is different temperature lights cast different colour hues as, um, as a result of those colour temperatures. So flu fluorescent lights tend to cast a slightly greenish blue hue, old tungsten lights that cast a yellow one. Mixing light types will create different colour temperatures and will um, play up to no extent with the camera sensor again as it tries to adjust or, um, white balance uh, to take care of those different temperature types. So always stick to a single lighting type and um, use it effectively. So our our light sources, we want 45 degrees to our participants, 45 degrees to our whiteboard. This creates um, a very natural looking uh, shadow, light and shadow effect on faces and stops reflection off the whiteboards being pointed back at cameras and things. Um, Dimmers, dimmers are really appropriate because then you've got at your fingertips a mechanism to play with the um, harshness of the light because you can absolutely have too much light. Too much light will wash everything out and send it very two-dimensional. By removing all shadows from a, uh, somebody's face, we actually turn it into a very flat appearing two-dimensional image. So we do want some shadows, we just don't want really harsh dark shadows. So as I said, we're looking at bouncing that light 45 degrees to the face. Um, we've got light coloured walls and we've got light, a light coloured table. We actually only use that table to, um, for our, to bounce light off that table up onto our faces to mitigate some of that shadowing that we're getting from our uh, key lights. And we'll look at that in this slide here. So basically we have three three sorts of light sources that we're dealing with in a video conference. There's our key light, which is our primary light source on a participant. Optimally between three and five hundred lux. For any old time photographers in the group, you'll uh, be well aware of using a light meter to 
um, have a look at lux and brightness, etc., etc. Um, realistically, seven seven hundred lux is the top of the top of the uh, scale that's as bright as we want it to be. That's really pushing the boundary between three and five hundred creates a great effect. And again, forty five to from 45 degree angle or ceiling bounce to the faces of our participants. Uh, fill light, so this as I said is to soften those key light shadows and we achieve that cheapest, most cost effective way is by that bounce of our light coloured table. So again, you know, our light coloured table needs to be a fairly neutral colour so that it's not throwing a colour cast up onto our participants' faces. And then background light. Um, it's one of the harder things to do but is really effective and rewarding when you get it right is the background field of view in any participant, any um, video conference. Think about it from the far end participants, how they're going to see that. Um, if you can, that background view, if you can ensure the back and side walls are smoothly and evenly lit, really good payback for that, a very effective look in conjunction with getting that, those other lighting aspects right. On the audio, on the audio side, uh, side of things, microphones are like antennas in that they have a shaped signal or a shaped range of effectiveness. So we can have directional microphones that go out to different ranges, or omnidirectional microphones. You know, some sensitive to out to a meter radius, some sensitive out to um, up to over three meters uh, radius, and still very, very effective. So. Um, depending on the size of the room, a uh, three metre radius gives you a six metre long room, um, so a small room, a single microphone may well be effective. If you're going to multiple microphones, then we're looking at making sure we've got some sort of mixer capability, because we don't want to leave that to chance that um, signal strengths and things are going to be correct just based on placement. So as soon as we go to mo multiple microphones, start looking at using a mixer capability so you can modify the signal strength coming from those devices applicable to uh, your room layout. On the speaker location, uh, lots, lots and lots of stuff around on speakers. You can go on Google speaker location and you'll get a hundred different theories. The one I subscribe to is the speakers should be 1.2 times the distance from the speaker to the listener. That's how far apart they should be. So the gap between A and B, 1.2 times the distance out to our speakers. Um, in terms of um, location, that distance we're talking about out to our table, we want that across as many of the speakers as uh, many of the participants as we can. So in a layout like you see on the screen here where we've got six people around a vertical table, what we're looking at is having um, that optimal speaker distance aimed at the middle of the table. Um, one, of, one of the things one of the things that there's a hell of a lot of material out there about these days is this um, study of psychoacoustics and this is how the brain responds to sound directions and um, so what becomes what it interprets as natural um, audio as compared to um, an unnatural response um, and how that affects our ability to listen and listen passively and um, attentively. So one of the things we're trying to achieve with our speaker location is to have the sound appear that it's coming from the same direction as our voices. This is why we have speakers you know, in small environments. We can put speakers at the front of the room and that can address everybody um, in that room. In larger environments, we need to go to ceiling speakers and we'll talk a bit more about that um, in the uh, next couple of slides. So how many speakers and how much power? So what we're aiming at with our audio is to get about 10 dB above the ambient noise in that room. So conversation is around 60 dB. Um, ambient noise level in an office is around 75 dB. So what optimally we're looking at being able to deliver somewhere between 70 and 85 dB of audio to all people in that room. And again, we're trying to make the sound come from a direction um, where the screens are to get that 
uh, realistic um, placement of the sound for us. Um, so for example, let's assume we've got a speaker that's rated at 90 dB and when they give you um, speaker ratings, they're talking about at one metre from the speaker. So the speaker um, will lose around about 6 dB every time the distance is doubled, so therefore um, at 2 metres from the speaker we've lost 6 dB, an additional 6 dB of sound, at 4 metres we've lost 12 dB, etc, etc. So <laughs> if the average sitting height for a person is about 1 metre, ceiling height of 3 metres, then um, we can see that a 90 dB, 94 dB speaker is going to provide plenty of sound effectively up to 88 dB of audio down at uh, head height in, in this room. Um, in terms of the area and number of speakers that are needed, um, a rule of thumb, but again only a rule of thumb is, is place speakers 1.5 times the 1.5 times the distance to the listener apart. So e.g. in a 4 um, metre ceiling, 3 metres to the listener, speakers can be around about 4.5 metres apart. If um, you want to, as I said, that's a rule of thumb. To calculate this uh, accurately, you need to look at your speaker specs, understand what the uh, cone angle is for your speakers, and they're usually about 100 degrees. Um, and then you can calculate using um, pi and uh, cone structure the actual area f based on the distance from the ceiling down to the listening height that the um, speaker is going to cover effectively and as I said um, and then allow for some overlap and some people will recommend for complete coverage and um, up to edge to centre overlap so Again, as I said, good rule of thumb is place speakers 1.5 times the distance to the listener apart. But there are some great documents out there on, on the internet to help you accurately um, measure that layout um, of, of the speakers you've purchased based on their specifications. Room layout, so what we're looking for um, both visually and from the audio, from an audio sense is to get everybody into a, into a single plane if we possibly can. So a lot of video conference rooms are going to be restricted to the first, the left hand side of the picture here where you've got a boardroom table, six people around it and because it's a multi-purpose meeting room. Right, if, we, if we have the ability to design a dedicated video conferencing room then we want to look at something like the right hand side of the screen here where we can get all the participants into uh, uh, close to a single plane as possible which means they're all at an optimal distance from the screen for uh, viewing that particular screen and then an optimal distance from the speakers for hearing the sound in a realistic manner. So that way we can give the best of all worlds to all people. Camera presets, um, there's lots and lots of different ways you can go with camera presets but um, probably the mandatory ones you want to look at is have a preset for the meeting leader you need a second preset that covers all the participants and if you're using a whiteboard you'll want a preset to cover that as well. So I said um, there's lots and lots of different ways you can deal with camera presets but um, those three are probably pretty mandatory. Um, next is if you're using a document camera, um, to use a docu document camera with the video platform we need a active um, switcher for that camera but um, if you're going to have a document camera you want that within reach or the uh, area the document camera shows within reach of your meeting leader again. Um, remotes again you want them where the meeting controller is, it may be the meeting leader or it may be an operator. Data share again same thing you want all this gear at a spot um, where the meeting leader or the operator has easy access and control of that to share it amongst all participants. In terms of TV height, eye level should be approximately a third of the way up from the bottom of the screen. So when you're wondering about just where on the wall to stick that 50 
50 inch plus uh, LED screen. Eye level, which eye level as I say is around about a metre off the floor, needs to be about a third of the way up that screen. But uh, yeah, check check the furniture. Um, distance from the screen. So um, distance from the screen here in the second two columns is shown in metres. The resolution of the screen has an effect on the distance you want to be from it. So a lower resolution screen, 720p, has bigger pixels. So to, to get the optimum viewing distance, you need to be further away from it. A 1080p um, resolution screen has smaller pixels. We can get up close without any pixel, pixelation effect. So a 65 inch screen only requires us to be about 2.5 metres away on a 10 point and a 1080p video conference. Um, so there you go, handy chart, keep it at your fingertips. Finally, room management, um, get, a, get a user guide or a poster in there for people coming in to use it who may not be that familiar with it, may not use it that often or may not have ever used it before at all. It takes them through all the steps to turn this on and how to control it. Have contact details there for an operator or someone who can provide assistance. Have a list of call wrap-up tasks that needs to be complete. Nothing more exciting than finding that you guys have walked out and left a video conference running and it runs for 13, 14 hours overnight with a shot of the Sydney conference room. So as they call wrap-up tasks that need to be completed. Additional services, if there's additional services available for the room as in being able to order coffees, food, whatever, you know, put the information there, have it at their fingertips so when people walk in they can do it. And in multi-purpose rooms as well, um, make sure you've taken that into consideration. So perhaps have that, um, don't have the conference equipment set up to auto answer so that any time Know, someone can start a conference and intrude straight into the middle of a um, non-conference based meeting. Um, keep the remotes, keep all the controls, keep you know whiteboard marks, put it all in one spot, make sure it's safe and make sure you mention that it goes back there when it's done. And in large panorama systems such as we sell where we have up to nine screens in a single uh, conference room, you know, there's a separate control panel for that um, separate to TV remotes and things. So make sure all that, you know, as I say, goes in one spot, has a home, and it goes into it all the time. And last but not least, put a vacant sign on the door. There's nothing more distracting for anybody than to have somebody stroll into the middle of a video conference when they're not meant to be there. So guys, I think that's about it. I'm going to open up the floor to any questions now. Hopefully that was useful. Um, look forward to talking to you next time if we don't have too many questions this time. If you've got any questions, use the interface to raise your hand, uh, such as Peter has now, and I'll unmute you and we'll take those questions. If you're feeling a bit bashful, there's a text interface there where you can uh, ask your questions there and I'll get to them as well. So Peter, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Look, nothing exciting. I'm just making sure that uh, you're going to send the um, a, a copy of the presentation. The pre would be useful to for further reference. Absolutely, Peter. The uh, presentation and a recording of it will be up on our website within the next 24 hours. So beautiful. Yeah, cool. easy. No dramas at all. Thanks, mate.